we have a delightful scene about road rage. And our grandest boy, very big boy, plays his mom, who has road rage. And he's, he does this wonderful scene. This boy, he almost didn't get a chance to perform because his teacher, and I didn't know this, he's in special ed. And here he is composing five scenes. And that's the magic. This is not about training people to be actors. No, it's not. Yeah. We want contributing adult citizens. He teaches teenagers how to rehearse for life. George Kahn of Honolulu, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one, -on -one, engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Honolulu's George Kahn helps Hawaii teenagers navigate that challenging time of life. He co-founded and leads the Alliance for Drama Education and its flagship performance group, T-Shirt Theater. T-Shirt Theater is based out of Farrington High School in Kalihi, Oahu, and uses what George calls a low-tech, high-zest approach to its productions. It's positive. Yeah, and a nice smile on your face. The future is yours. It's more yours than it is mine. The students don't use elaborate sets or costumes, and their honest, raw performances resonate with audiences. Many of the plays are written by the students and have helped young adults explore issues like racial prejudice, bullying, abuse, and teen suicide. George Kahn's own path to becoming an educator and theater director was anything but conventional. He spent his early years in the sleepy plantation town of Pu'unene Maui, but his country lifestyle was put on hold for a few years. You know, uh, growing up, I didn't spend the whole time on Maui. What happened? You, you moved. Yes, yes. After I was, when I was about four, my sister was eight, my mom and dad decided that instead of being a nurse, she wanted to have a schedule that was closer to ours. So she wanted to go and get their teaching certificate from the University of Hawaii. In Manoa. In Manoa, Honolulu. Honolulu. So for a Japanese lady to take her kids to another island, leave her husband on, that's, that's a no-no. In fact, we were split right in half in our family. His parents thought it was a bad idea. Because she was leaving her husband. What will people think, right? It was like, no, no, no. Did he consider going with her? I guess. Well, how he oh, needed he to earn, keep oh. the money, right? How was she going to pay for tuition? And what did he do at the plantation? What well, he was an accountant. Okay, so he controlled he was a, the money. Yeah, he, he not for the plantation. He was a, a public accountant. Oh, he had I his see. own business. So he couldn't leave that business. He had t clients. And, and she, she had to leave the island because there was no four-year institution there, yeah, on Maui, not Maui at the time. Not, now they have one, but, you know, yeah. th that was then. So, that, yeah, that must have been the that talk a, of the camp. <laughs> that was a big deal. But her mom and dad, when they found out about uh, the feathers being ruffled, I think they got on the phone with them and said, mind your own business. Ooh. She's going to do this. A two-family squabble. Yeah. But, you know, they, they didn't come to blows or anything like that, but it was a rift. So dad obviously couldn't go to his own parents' house to eat dinner. So he went to mom's house, mom's family's house. He would have dinner there every night. And then uh, one of the neighbor ladies who did his laundry for him would have him come over for dinner as well. So he, he, he got no support from his own family. But, but so he supported his wife in, in, yes. in her yes. goals. And, yes. and he apparently couldn't cook or wash his clothes himself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he was, he was uh, taken care of. Well, four years is a long time. It's a long time. Well, so we'd go home in summer times and What did winter. you do? Well, so well, your mom was in class, you, you were in school. So I went but still, to, it must have been hard. Yeah, I went to many schools. You know, I, went, I can remember being at Hickam, I, Ben Parker, Alawai School. I think I was at Because Alawai she was school. renting around town? Or? Well, we, you know how it is. Right? You stay with family first before you rent. And then finally we rented our own place at Eisenberg Street. And she walked up to campus. Maybe she was the, three miles or the so? The healthiest she's ever been in her life. Wow, that, that yeah. was a big deal for you and your sister, too, because this is Honolulu and Kaneohe. Yes, yes, yes. Great lesson, probably for your sister especially, the, that mom has a career goal. And actually, the career goal was in order to 
be around you folks more. Yes, yes, yes. You know, she was a very effective teacher. She taught first grade. We're at Alikai. Alikai School. Mm -hmm. And did the two families come together after never, this? Never. No, it was it, it never it was never healed. It just stayed as a as a rift. After George Kahn's mother completed her degree at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and became a teacher, the family moved back to Pu'unene Maui. What were you interested in in high school? What kind of interest picked your Student government. And I don't know how it happened, because I came from this really small school, Pu'unene School. But when I got to Baldwin, I got right off, freshman class president, sophomore student body president. Student body when you're a sophomore? Sophomore. So that got me invited to Lexington, Kentucky for a national student government conference. You were a talker, weren't you? I was. You could make speeches. I was, was, yeah. Uh, yeah. You weren't shy. I was not. So here I am thinking I'm going to do something with public speaking, maybe be a, a politician or a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then I see this fabulous Chinese dancer named Al Huang. He came to Baldwin and he's dancing with a Caucasian partner in modern dance, never seen modern dance before. And when I saw it, you know, I, I wasn't attracted to ballet, but modern dance had elements of gymnastics and martial arts, and which were, I had. You were into those things, those martial things. arts and gymnastics? Yeah. Al Huang, okay. the modern dancer, gave me that idea that maybe I'd like to try this. So uh, oftentimes when touring artists come, they'll do a workshop on the weekend. I went to the workshop. I was the only boy. Not surprising, right? But I stayed and I said to myself, when I go to college, it has to have modern dance. So Grinnell had modern dance. And that's where George Kahn went after high school, a private liberal arts school in the middle of Iowa. But very soon I found that dance was related to theater. It's in the same department. I started to take courses in both dance and theater. And then, a year and a half into Grinnell, I got a chance to go to Milwaukee Repertory Theater. There I met Rick Zunk, who had just come back from Nepal. Mm -hmm. He was a very, very accomplished professional actor who was kind of disenchanted with how theaters were run. And he had a book by Jerzy Krotowski called Towards a Poor Theater. You know, my low-tech, high-zest email address comes from that aesthetic. He said, theater is too fat. It's got way too many things that film can do much better. You shouldn't try to replicate reality. Because what theater has that no other art form has is the live relationship between the actor and the audience. You can really discard almost everything else, which was pretty revolutionary at the time. That's right. So here, with Rick, I created at Grinnell a piece called, uh, I didn't even title it, it was uh, based on the character of Pentheus from Euripides' The Bacchae. I don't know if you ever come across that in classics. So it's a, it's a movement piece with very few words. And I show it to my dance teacher and I show it to my theater instructor at Grinnell. And both of them kind of pat my head and say, that's very interesting. End of story. When I take it to Milwaukee Repertory Theater and show it to Rick, he starts directing me. And he starts to evolve and develop the character that I had started. And he says, this is the kind of theater I want to be making. Would you be interested in coming to join me and a few others at the University of Iowa, which has a Center for New Performing Arts that's just going to start? And Iowa City is just an hour away from Grinnell, coincidentally. But it's a world away. It's where the International Writing Workshop, where Tennessee Williams got to start. What did your parents think? Because oh, you here, left college. Here it is, yeah. I, 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 I had trepidations about making that phone call because I'm the only son. My dad, eldest of five boys, the smartest of the litter, and he didn't go to college because his father begged him to help send the other boys. So all the other brothers went to college, but not him. So his only son. He's going to live through you. You were going to get your <laughs> I degree. I was going to get my degree. And he said, take business administration. <laughs> uh -oh. And here I am studying drama and dance, right? And then I call him and say, Dad, I got this opportunity to join this professional group. It's 
a Rockefeller funded five year project of the University of Iowa. If I'd gotten my degree, I would have to work for seven or eight years before I could even position myself to go for a grant like this. It's being put in my lap here. And I'm not even finished college, but they f feel I have what it takes. So you substituted <laughs> your capture of a college degree with professional experience. Professional job, fully paid. We didn't have to wait tables, drive cabs. It was not fat, but we had a living stipend, which is like unheard of, right? George Kahn continued to perform professionally with the Iowa Experimental Theater Lab, which eventually relocated to Baltimore, Maryland, and later toured in New York and France. Then George began to share his style of experimental theater at New York University. The company starts to fragment, you know? Uh, people start to leave, and <clears throat> I get picked up at NYU. They want me to head up um, what we do with the lab work in something they call the experimental theater wing. You were hired to be a teacher. I was hired to be a teacher. And you didn't teacher. have a college degree. I did not have a- And you worked for NYU. I worked for NYU, isn't that something? Yeah, because in the experimental theater wing, it didn't matter your certification. It mattered that you had, that you made theater. Mm -hmm. And we had worked for, by that time, six or seven years in this form a la Grotowski. And at the time, were you going to Broadway plays? Were you, were, were you enjoying the city? I got invited to try out for Pacific Overtures. And did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, somebody scouted me and said, you know, I think you would be good for this. That's not the way you wanted to go. Well, it kind of flickered through my mind that that would be interesting to see if I could cut it, you know, doing that. But we hadn't, we hadn't finished. At the time that I was made that offer, we hadn't finished with our work with the lab. I was still in the full course of creating plays for them. If that had happened after when I was in between things, I might have... I might have gone but for But there that. were a lot of people who would have said, are you kidding? I'm going to grab that. It's, it's, it's a choice I may never get again. But right. you said, no, I'm committed to what I'm doing. Right. At the time, uh, the work that I was doing with the lab was, uh, was really interesting and consuming, all consuming. Mm -hmm. While teaching at NYU, George Kahn would reunite with an old friend, Walt Dulaney, whom he met back in high school. The two would go on to form a partnership that would span three decades. You know, Walt and I had been friends since I was in high school. Okay, this is Walt Dulaney. Walt, the famous Walt Dulaney. I met him, the way I met him is, um, he, I knew he did prom assemblies. I asked, would you come to Baldwin and do a prom assembly? And that's how I met him. Wow, and this is a guy who would be your artistic partner for years. Yes, for years. So Walt and I, uh, Walt went to uh, Rochester Institute of uh, Technology to um, get his uh, photo illustration degree at the same time that I was doing the work with the lab. And then we reconnected in New York to teach the experimental theater wing. He assisted me. And then when the first snows would come, we would relocate to Hawaii. And Farrington was one of the first places that we anchored in. Why is that? We got uh, Wally Chapel, who ran HTY. We, we got hired at HTY first as their education directors. And we suggested to them that they should run drama education in the schools. HTY didn't go for that project, so we decided to branch off on our own. So Wally helped us meet Alfred Price. Do you remember Alfred Price? Alfred Price was an architect, and he, a state foundation state on culture foundation, and the arts. State foundation on culture and the arts. But he was a czar. He was the art czar. And everything that went, he said go. And he funded it. He funded it, right. So Alfred gave us our first, first grant. It was called Suitcase Theater. And in that grant, we, we were, our goal was to meet every drama teacher in the state. Oh. So we went with our suitcase to every, and we didn't have a car. So we went by bus all the way out to Kahuku. Walt and I, from the Suitcase Theater grant, discovered that of all the schools, Farrington was most like the neighbor island schools. The kids were super appreciative of what we did. Even if they had a hard time doing our stage fright workshops, they loved, you know, they were, they had aloha. 
stage fright workshops. What are yeah, those? Yeah, you know, audience manners. Okay, th and this is actually what got you a, a permanent role at, at Farrington, Farrington High School. Yes. Audience manners. So there was we, a need for, to teach the so we, we, students' we, manners at uh, assemblies. Yes, yes, indeed. So we, we, our workshops uh, had a component called performer fitness, project, pronounce, with poise, chick, chick, ah, and personality. <laughs> Everything's alliterated, right? Those four aspects are what we teach for the actors. And then audience have to pay attention, uh, show appreciation, appropriate applause. That part is what Sherilyn Tom saw when she came to see our Midsummer Nights workshop with the gifted and talented students. She said, I want that. Because our kids are so rowdy, we can't have assemblies. Can you help us? Well, and when, when was this? What, what was, was the year when the, the, the audiences were so unruly? 1980. Okay. Early, very early. But Sherilyn Tom, English department chair, was a visionary. She said, this is what you do. Teach Shakespeare four days in the classroom. On day five, take them into the auditorium, just their class. Have each of them stand in the solo spotlight. Puts off. What light tree when the window breaks, <laughs> right? One by one. They will earn empathy for the guts it takes to be on stage. That's, that is very, that's a really brilliant idea. It's a brilliant idea. Empathy from yes, the audience. Yes, empathy. So four years later, we could open the doors because everybody knew how to be an audience. That's amazing. Same lady says, you get these kids all excited. Why don't you take the most talented kids you saw during the year and do a summer drama workshop? So we did just that. Six weeks later, couldn't let go of the kids. So we go to Alfred Price, right? State Foundation. Normally, it takes a, a year to apply for grants, da, da, da. We just asked him, would you fund our dream project? We're in Kalihi at Farrington. We're going to call it T-shirt theater. What do you say? He gave it to us. George Kahn and Walt Eulaney co-founded T-shirt theater in Honolulu in 1985. And George estimates they've touched the lives of more than 10,000 students. Walt Eulaney passed away in 2011. And George continues to serve as executive director and artistic director of the program. Yeah, well, we, we are a private, not-for-profit corporation. Alliance for Drama Education is the mothership, and T-Shirt Theater is the flagship, the most visible and heartstrings part. And you followed Alliance. your mentors, and you, you didn't go for the costumery. It's, uh, it's imagination that yes. really, uh, you know, you, you basically... Low-tech, high-zest. Is, is T-Shirt Theater an after-school program? Yes. So what, what hours is it? it? It goes Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 3 to 5.30. And we go 11 months out of the year. And can any child in the district any participate? Any child on the island, if they can get themselves there to rehearse with us. And do they have to pay to enter? There is no fee. How you pay is by coming promptly and consistently to rehearsal and giving it your 100%. The first project is the envoys. That's where we take small teams of actors to each of the, was it, 10 feeder elementaries to Farrington. They perform for each class. We do like five classes a day. And then they coach small groups of students to perform for their own class by the end of the 45-minute period. It's an amazing process to see these kids who sometimes are very, very shy be able to do this. So it's a very big project. They have to take a whole day off from school to do this. But that's one project. Then there's the fall show, and then there's the spring show. And if they do two out of the three, we can, you know, you can take a pass. You can say, I need to take a leave of absence. So you do treat them as professionals in the as sense that we expect you to be here. Yes. Here's the requirements. Yes. Because, uh, and, and, if, and actually, if they don't show up, then you're, you're, you're left with uh, <laughs> you're a, a real Puka, not it is a puka, but a puka in your yes, program. It is a puka. So that's a real world lesson. You know, there's a real, yes. there's a real uh, consequence when you don't show up. I think uh, why I love drama education so much, particularly when it comes to performance, even in elementary schools, is when you don't say your line correctly or when you don't show up, somebody suffers and they will let you know about that. You know, and I think 
academics sometimes don't have that real world consequence. Do, do the students determine their own material in t-shirt theater? We work to a theme. And this last show actually came to us from uh, two of the actors. They said, George, can we do something with memories? I said, memories, memories. Let me think about that. I like the idea, but I didn't want to just be nostalgic. So as Jonah and I were discussing it, I said, how about memories to capture or capture? Capture is going to be like our title. So, you know, we'll, can you distill it even to a moment when you were changed? That's, and that became the prompt. That's a good question. What yes. came out of that? Our show, Memories to Capture. That was our spring show. The, the one that touches me the most is uh, a scene we call In Due Time. And this boy is trying to figure out how he can come out. And so he says, uh, in the scene, he, he converses with his, his conscience. And he's kind of deciding who's going to be the first one that I tell this to. Can I tell my parents? No. Uh, can I tell my best friend? Uh, she's not really ready to hear this. Uh, can I tell my sister? Yes. So he, this boy has a really good relationship with his sis. So he comes out to his sis. And then he comes out to his good friend. And the good friend, you can see, really has trouble with this. And then he comes home. As he's opening the door, he overhears mom and dad talking. And mom is saying, Stelton, Stelton, where are you? And dad is saying, where is that boy? Mom says, maybe he has a girlfriend. I've never seen him with any girls. If that boy is gay, I will have failed in my role as father. So he never comes in the house, right? Stelton chooses to do this at the public show where his dad is in the audience. He is not disclosed to his family. Wow. That's some guts, huh? After the show, dad gives him a big hug. Son, I love you. That's right. <laughs> You're dealing with um, youth who are going through all kinds of all changes kinds and adjustments changes. and very big struggles, especially in a low-income area where there, there's just, you know, sometimes there is some dysfunction. I mean, it, it, some of the kids are really vulnerable. Very, very vulnerable. And, and your career is still going strong in this, and it's all... Um, you're, you're still following this course that uh, nobody instructed you in. You, you know, you see where it takes you, and you make the best of it, and you, you're looking to mold young people. I am, I am, and I'm hoping that uh, Jonah and Primo are able to carry it. You know, I'm grooming them as a legacy. You know, if, as a parent, if you form a business, you hope your son or your daughter will take it over, right? Primo came from an inaugural t-shirt theater group, and now he's back coaching. He's the one that sells Harleys. Story about Primo. Um, he's closing the windows one day, and the windows in the room pops and cracks and cuts him. So he's got this kind of scar on his wrist. So remember that. He's working at Zippy's, and his supervisor comes roaring in on a motorcycle, coincidentally, very pissed off. He and his girlfriend are having some kind of fight, throwing pots and pans. So Primo, who has played a number of counseling scenes in t-shirt theater, starts to say some of the words from one of his scenes. Hey, what you doing, man? Chill. You know, he starts to try to talk the guy down. Guy doesn't want to have anything. What, what are you talking about? And, you know, he doesn't give him the time of day. Primo keeps on talking about it, and at one point he goes like this. He doesn't say anything, he just shows him. And the guy goes, whoa, you too. Because he's suicidal, this kid. Primo says, you know what, you should go home. I got it covered over here, go home. Call me as soon as you get home. What for? I want just talk story. And he, he got the manager to go home. That is a good life skill, and, and a manager still with us today, I presume. Yes. Mm. So, life following art. Script it, and then use it. Rehearsing for life, that is our mission. 
In 2018, T-Shirt Theatre presented Kipuka, an anti-bullying project that explores the issues of bullying, cyberbullying, and teen suicide prevention. This latest production, under the artistic direction of George Kahn, was original and drew from the true life experiences of his students. T-Shirt Theatre continues to serve as a kipuka, like green growth in a lava field, for the next generation of students. And while George looks to pass on the direction of T-Shirt Theatre to the next generation, he told me during this conversation in the summer of 2019, he's not ready to exit the stage yet. Mahalo to George Kahn of Palolo Valley in Honolulu. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Long Story Short on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha Nui. Take two. <laughs> Very much. That came from Walt. So T-shirt theater, because we rehearse, is a perfect uh, environment for that. You know, and the kids learn that if they make a mistake, they can always take two. And I think if, they, you know, if we can help them understand that that doesn't just go for drama, that goes for anything that you're trying to accomplish, there's really almost always a chance to redo. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org.